there folks and welcome into today's video. We have oh, not one, not two, not three, but four videos to react to in this video here. Uh, all smaller ones that I thought were uh, worth me sharing my opinion on and uh, kind of sharing with you guys here and driving some attention to, okay? First one up here is Snap plans to cut 20% of their employees. I think that's a very important, I have a very important point I wanna make in regards to that video, okay? Investors getting too defensive could be a big mistake. We're gonna react to that one there. PayPal gets an upgrade from Bank of America. PayPal is a stock I have personally bought a lot of shares in this year. I never owned PayPal stock until this year. The stock absolutely got obliterated. And uh, I was like, hmm, I think I got some uh, pretty good pricing on my PayPal shares there. So uh, I want to react to that one and share my opinion there. And then this one here, we're interested in small and mid cap equities. We're going to react to that one as well. I thought about splitting all these videos apart, but I thought let's just, you know, put them all. They're all like two to four minute clips. I'll put them all in one big video, react to them all. Hope you guys enjoyed as always, rather than like splitting it, you know, off into a bunch of different videos and things like that. So I appreciate you guys joining me. We're almost at 10,000 subscribers now. Are you flipping my flapjacks? That's absolutely insane. So thank you everybody for being here and subscribe to the channel. I appreciate each and every one of you. And also just so you know, if you didn't already know, you might already know, we have an absolutely epic, massive Become a Master Stock Market sale coming on my number one course ever that is going to be uh, basically a flash sale on Labor Day. So if you want to get notified and receive that deal as soon as it drops on Labor Day, check out the pin comment down there. Enter in your email, your phone number, and we'll send over that deal when it drops on Labor Day. Alrighty, guys, let's get into this. On that, we will turn to our Julia Borston. Julia, good morning. Carl, good morning to you. Snap announcing is restructuring its business to focus on three strategic priorities. It's community growth, that's the user growth, revenue growth, and also augmented reality. The company is saying that as a result, they are reducing their employee count by 20%. That's nearly 1,500 people. They're also creating the new role of chief operating officer, promoting Jerry Hunter. He was previously SVP of engineering into this new role. Now, in addition to engineering, Product and sales will also report up to him to improve collaboration among those three divisions. Now, Snap says this will generate about $500 million in cost savings on an annualized basis. Snap also announced- I'd love to hear from you guys in that comment section, by the way. Like, what do you think about Snap? Does Snap have a bright future in front of it over the coming years? Do you think this could be a $20, $40, $60 stock again? Um, or do you think it's just gonna be one of those floundering stocks that you know, is five, 10, $15 for years and years to go in the future? I'd love to hear your guys' perspective and opinion on that. I'll share my, Rev I'll share my opinion in just a moment growth of 8% so far in Q3. Now that's far better than the flat revenue growth the company reported on July 21st um, for quarter to date in its last earnings report, but it is still down from the 13% revenue growth reported in Q2, did though show that uptick from a lull in July. Now CEO Evan Spiegel sending a memo to employees saying that they have decided to discontinue investments in Snap Originals, minis, games, and Pixie. Remember, Pixie's that flying selfie drone. They're also winding down standalone applications, Zenly and Voicey. CEO Evan Spiegel writing, quote, we are also reorganizing our team to better meet the challenges of the current macroeconomic environment and to make as much progress as possible, as quickly as possible, in areas of our business that we are able to control. Now, guys, this all comes after yesterday. We learned of the departure of SNAP's chief business officer, Jeremy Gorman, and Peter Naylor, who's VP of Americas, both of those executives leaving for Netflix. Back over. Okay, so yeah, they, they, they lost some people to Netflix because basically Netflix is gonna have um, you know an advertising business uh, now. So a couple perspectives here, okay, that I think are important. One is this shows you that the stock market is in total control of everything basically, okay? So here we are in a moment in time, right? Where Snap stock is just going down and down and down. And the reason it's going down is like many other uh, typical growth stocks, right? The market is not valuing these companies anywhere close to the way it used to value these companies. And in the past, as long as you were putting up growth, right? And especially big growth, you commanded a big valuation on your company, right? now. For a lot of these companies, growth slowed substantially, including a snap, right? And so the market says, we're not valuing the same. And we're in a very different environment now that's very scary, right? That's why the NASDAQ's down like 25% plus this year, right? That's why the S&P 500's down big this year. That's why all the indexes are down big this year. Everybody's very concerned and scared, and growth is not there. 
So people look at this and they're like, we're not going to pay what we used to pay for you, Wall Street says, okay? Therefore, Snap says, oh crap, you know, we're not, they're not giving this valuation, the respect we used to get. We've got to cut spending on this and that and this because, gosh, we got to start making a profit. And that's where a lot of these companies are going. And that's why there's such a move to profitability now at this point in time, because these companies, if you had a huge valuation on yourself before, you could raise money no problem. And no one no one blinked an eye, right? Especially in late 2020 into most of 2021. You, you had a huge valuation. You raised capital. You diluted shareholder value. No one cared. It was all good. But we're in a very different market now. And now, if you're going to try to raise capital in this market, get ready for your stock price to likely tank more, okay? Not only that, but now you have to rate, you're gonna have to dilute shareholder value way more because your valuation has decreased in you know, a 60, 70, 80% way. And so that, may, that puts all stocks like this in a very, very tough category. And that's why there's such a focus on profitability now that there hasn't been in the past. And that's why Snap was like trying all these different things in the past because they were able to command a big valuation in the company, right? Now, it's like, oh, uh, no, we can't really do that anymore. So now they're focusing all on profitability and they're cutting all these little side projects and things like that that obviously sucked a lot of money from the company. Okay. Second thing is, Snap, how do I feel about the stock? Do I think this is going to be a good stock over the coming years or not? Obviously, the value of the stock has decreased massively. So my personal opinion is I think Snap's in a very, very tough spot. Here's the deal, okay? Obviously, people have a finite amount of, uh, let's just call it attention, uh, time they can spend on different apps and websites and things like that, okay? The problem for Snap is they have three very, very serious competitors that are kind of taking people's time and attention away, okay? They obviously have to always deal with Meta, which owns, obviously, Facebook platform and Instagram platform. Facebook platform ages up a little bit, so it doesn't compete as much with Snap, but Instagram directly competes with Snap. There's no doubt about that, okay? And Instagram already basically took their best feature, which was the Stories feature. Puts the company in a very, very tough spot, okay? On top of that, TikTok has emerged over the last couple of years as a legit serious thing for people's attention. And a lot of, especially the younger generation that was Snap's core fan base, goes on TikTok a ton and spends an immense amount of time on there, right? And also you have other things that drive, uh, you know, take people's attention away like Netflix, YouTube, things like that, okay? So I just look at Snap as like, I almost kind of view it like maybe a slightly better version of like a Twitter or something like that. We're just kind of like a one trick pony that's in a really tough spot against really, really tough competitors. And it's not the creme de la creme. And so therefore it puts Snap in a very, very tough position. Also, simultaneously, the company's in a very confused spot now because it's got very, weak, very weak growth. 8%, you know, so far this quarter to date. Okay, that's respectable, but you know, 8% is not that impressive. Like, heck, I could get 8% at Meta and probably even better than that at Meta, right? And we're talking about a company that's already profitable in, in the green in a massive, massive way, right? And that's trading at a very, very cheap P ratio and forward P ratio. So these are just some of the things to consider when it comes to Snap. I'd love to hear your guys' opinion as always down there. Next one up here, investors getting too defensive. Then we'll get into the PayPal and then we'll get into uh, the small cap and mid cap. Uh, you, you, your point is largely... Uh, investors getting warned about a lot of stuff, right? Jackson Hole, uh, seasonality, QT, but your, your, your advice QT? is to not get too defensive. Why? Yeah, thanks for having me, Carl. So we are fully invested, but definitely a little bit more cautious. In our diversified portfolio, we're holding excess cash levels today. And I think that just speaks to the amount of uncertainty in the environment. But in all due respect, can't be fully invested if you got some cash, right? You could be heavily invested, which is kind of like me. Like I'm heavily invested. Like I have 80% plus of my money in the stock market right now, but I'm also holding, you know, maybe 15% ish cash, something like that. So maybe I'm 85, defensive. 85, 15. So I'm mostly invested, but I'm not fully invested. Fully invested means you literally you're all in the market. You don't have any cash left just to be clear. I think could be a big mistake. We did see a, a nice rally uh, through the June to August period. Uh, as a reminder of why you don't want to be too much on the sidelines. And we do think inflation is set to slow. Um, I think it was a little bit misguided for investors to be expecting 
uh, too much in the way of rate cuts in 2023. We're getting some of that priced out of the market post Jackson Hole. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I think there could be vulnerability ahead, a little bit of, of volatility, certainly. But for long term investors, we still see uh, opportunity looking out over a. T- what a weird chart to show, by the way. No one looks at a two month chart like what in the world? month horizon. We don't think a recession is necessarily, um, you know, fully guaranteed at this point. Right. Okay. When the market started pricing in uh, rate cuts in the first quarter of next year, clearly now, I mean, Mester's message and William's message uh, yesterday was that w- we could get to three and a half or four and just stay there, right? This this sort of raise and hold. Does that change the, uh, the, the strategy, the playbook, or, or do you try to tune out a lot of this Fed speak, basically? Well, so it's a good point. It doesn't really change our playbook. Uh, We were very skeptical of the idea that the Fed would try to be so surgical with monetary policy as to raise uh, the rate to a certain level and then just a couple months later start to cut. Um, And I think that was really, really diminishing the importance of that terminal or peak Fed funds rate. Um, For our view, we actually think that the inflation data is going to allow the Fed to be a little bit more dovish than what the market is pricing in at this point. That 4% peak Fed funds rate would be higher than we're expecting. We're expecting about three and a quarter to three and a half, actually, and then the Fed to pause. Um, but I think as we look out over you know the next 12 months, we have to also recognize that the Fed is trying to uh, communicate, but it is ultimately going to re- rely on the data. We got a constructive core PCE uh, and core CPI print for last month. That went a little bit unnoticed because of uh, the Jackson Hole speech happening on the same day. Um, and we think that we could see some moderate, more moderating inflation ahead, of course. Wait. Yeah, so I agree with that, a lot of that. I think the one overarching point she makes there is important about being too defensive. Um, you know, definitely Wall Street's position, position to very, very defensive, cash, heavy shorts, puts, things like that. Um, probably gotten a little little too defensive, unless you really are th- uh, convinced like the market's going to fall like fifty percent or something like that. Outside of that scenario, it's a it's a you know you got to understand we have already had so much thrown at this market now at this point in time, and uh, a lot of people get confused because they think potentially the economy could get worse, right? But it doesn't matter. Like the market can go up even in a worsening economic environment as long as the, the market is convinced that six months, 12 months out, things are going to be better, essentially. We, we witnessed this in 2009. In our, you know, very early 2009, when the com- economy was a disaster and it was actually getting worse, the stock market bottomed and the economy continued to get worse. There were still a ton of job losses. Unemployment was insanely high. Uh, company earnings were still very weak and the market was kind of going up and up and up. And so the market just it's always looking out six to 12 months in the future. And as long as it's convinced that six months out, 12 months out, things will be better than they are today. That's when you get these moves up in the market. Okay. And so we've got to kind of see that obviously all play out there. And I think it's important to always be mainly invested in the market. And, you know, if you feel uncomfortable, then you can build up cash a little bit. But if you get over 30% cash, you're just not working hard enough to find good deals out there. Or you're just playing too scared, in my personal opinion, okay? Or you're trying to do too much of the whole timing the market game, which we know is a losing strategy, okay? PayPal gets an upgrade from Bank of America. Let's listen to this one. There's a bullish call out on PayPal today. The stock got upgraded to buy at Bank of America. They expect activist investor Elliott Management to push for more cost cuts. We've made it our call of the day. Amy Raskin. I feel like this stock, man, I feel like it's gone from love to loathed. Nobody here owns it today. And the yeah. valuations come way down. I mean, the, the analyst who made this call was on, uh, I think it was Tech Check before us, pointed out the stock is now trading at a 12% premium to the overall market. It has been at 75% <laughs> at times. That gives you an idea of how the multiple has come way down. Why not attractive now? You know, we've never really loved the fintech sector. Actually, we've never really been there. Um, you know, my view very much is that the credit card business is very much a duopoly, and that it's not a big upgrade, by the way. I mean, it's decent, but nothing, nothing crazy for a stock like PayPal that's down so much. Consumers don't really want to pay to pay, so people don't really like fees associated with payments. So they, they expect it to be free. There's a lot of competition in the space. There was a lot of capital that was put into this space. 
so we just don't see the longer term profitability opportunities there. Um, so, so we're not there and we've honestly never been there. So we yeah. missed the ride up and we're missing the ride down. I know you own v- okay, so, you know, okay, so <laughs> first off here, she just made a, you know, an argument that a lot of money has been uh, put in fintech. Do you think that money's still coming in fintech? No, okay. Uh, fintech has been absolutely decimated. Not, you know, PayPal might be the best of the situation. Look at Square stock. Look at a firm stock. Look at up, Upstart. Look at, you know, you can go through stock after stock after stock from the biggest of the big dogs like a PayPal that are considered fintech, right, to the smaller and smaller companies. Those stocks have been absolutely obliterated. Look at the Robin Hoods and all those sorts of companies as well, okay? So the fact is, all the VC money that was coming in fintech is not coming in fintech anytime soon because they've seen what's happened to the valuations of these companies now at this point in time. There was a moment in time when fintech was in a big bubble. You know, end of 2020 when a lot of things were in a bubble, in the beginning of 2021. And, you know, valuations are sky high and anything fintech related, okay? So days are long gone. And the valuations have come down 70, 80, 90% on almost all of these, okay? And so now at this point in time, you know, that, that crazy just, you know, money out there is not really there, right? Plus, you got PayPal that also owns not just PayPal, but Venmo. Those are the established players in this market. And I, I, I don't think they get nearly enough credit for the fact that they have two of the top five most important or two of the top three most important financial related apps in the United States of America. Um, I I mean, you can't just, you know, uh, you can't just like brush past that. That's like absolutely crazy. It's no different than I look at Meta and I look at, you know, them not only owning Facebook platform, but also owning Instagram and WhatsApp, like three of the most important apps in the world that have the most users, right? It's incredible. So, you know, those sorts of companies, you can't just like kind of throw those to the wayside and act like they're kind of nothing in my opinion. As as do you, Shannon. And it's the same question. Really? Um, if not now, when? Well, Scott, um, we actually owned PayPal last year, and we only owned it for about six months, which for us is a really short holding period. Um, we were looking at, you know, we had lost about almost 20% on the stock already when we sold it last year. It's down another 55% since we bought it, or since we sold it, excuse me. And I think the problem is, is you're seeing slower growth rates. And I do think that there's an opportunity um, for additional monetization for PayPal, but I think they have to get their costs right in terms of the average revenue per user that they're generating versus cost spend. And so I think that this upgrade, although it might be a little bit too early for us to go back into the space because we do think the payment space, to Amy's point, is incredibly competitive, um, you're starting to see the stock down to a valuation where if you can bring costs in and you can start to focus on that revenue per user rather than net ads, Mm -hmm. um, this could be an opportunity in the... You hear uh, what she just said there? She's like, it might be a little too early for us to get in. That's so much of, of how Wall Street thinks about these things. They need to see, you know, confirm momentum, not just in the business model, but the stock price. And then as it goes, and I know this sounds ridiculous to, to folks listening to this, right? It's like, come on, man, like they really do this, but they do this. And they like to see it hit this moving average, and this moving average and moving up and it like it gets confirmed, right? And then they start buying in. And then as it goes up more, they buy more. And there's a, there's a thought process on a lot of Wall Street that is like buy, buy the winners essentially, okay? And invest even heavier into your winners. And so as it wins, it wins more and more and more money comes in this is how you get a stock price to keep going up and up and up it's not just about the underlying business fundamentals although that's obviously the key over the long term especially if you're looking at a six 12 month horizon right it's all about kind of getting that that money flowing there and it's the way wall street does it it's not the way i do it it's not the way i agree with um but they need to see momentum continue to come in this stock and a lady like this she you know and a lot of these wall streeters man they would rather paypal go to 130 Buy it at a start buying at 130 and uh, you know, play it from that side rather than buy it now and risk it going down to 74. That's the way they think about this thing. And you know, it's not the way I think about it, but it's the way they think about it, and they just run money differently. And remember, with a lot of them, it's about the optics and the way things look, right? Here how specific she was trying to be about, oh, we sold it here, you know, and da, da, da. You know, they care so much about the optics of how it looks to people that might be invested with them and things like that, right? And so, you know, it's hard to buy a PayPal for somebody like this. And even if they might think it's a good buy, just for the mere fact that, you know, people might judge them and be like, oh, you're in PayPal? That stock's gotten obliterated this year. It's down 50% year to date. They don't want to even be associated with the fact that the stock's down 50% year to date. Me, I'm like, I don't freaking care. I just, I'm just about the money, man. I'm just trying to make money. 
you know, uh, give me, give me PayPal shares under a hundred dollars. Give me them, give me them, give me them. I bought a lot of them because I think the stock's going to 300 over the coming years. So, you know, that's just my perspective. It's a different, it's a different perspective. And, um, you know, that's just how it is. It's a couple of years. Jimmy, you're emblematic of love to loathe, right? You owned it. Now you don't. You own Visa instead. Why? I, and maybe I'll go love to neutral. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, because I, I honestly don't hate it, but I think the problem and why I'm neutral is I really don't know what I'm rooting for in PayPal. Um, this was a stock, as you pointed out, and the analyst pointed out, that was trading at a 50 times multiple. Now it's at a 20 times multiple. Is it- when he just said, I don't know what I'm rooting for here, that just shows me that PayPal has, um, has a problem getting through to the Wall Street of folks. And they need to storytell better. They need to make sure folks like this Jim Liebenthal here understand exactly what they're going after and what they need to be rooting for and why this is big time. It's clear PayPal executives aren't doing a good enough job telling the story to Wall Street. And that's another reason why the stock's faltered. You've got to be able to tell them a story that they understand. If they can't understand the story and understand where it's going, they won't buy the stock. People started buying Meta stock back in the day, uh, you know, well after they went IPO because they started to understand the story. When at first went IPO, it did horrible. Okay, a stock like Palantir has a lot of trouble telling the story to Wall Street right now. And when a, a company has trouble telling the story to Wall Street, those stocks falter. Even if, even if the business model is headed in the right direction, you got to have your story on point as a public company so people know exactly what they're investing and exactly what they're going after and exactly why this is a great buy at 94 enough maybe but what if we're actually getting a turnover from growth investors which it was to value investors are. that are reflecting the change in strategy that man we are 100 percent. it's been a move from a lot of the growth folks that you know are just there for the hype and the excitement and the crazy growth rates to the the value folks that are looking at this and like hey man this is pretty attractive on a valuation basis they got dot 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 growth they're going to likely grow net income at a steeper rate than their revenue is going to grow over the next five years that makes this stock very very attractive went through a year ago where it was it went from growth at any cost to quality growth. I, I, I think you've got a long time in the penalty box as that shareholder turnover turns over. In the meantime, I know what I've got in Visa. I know what I'm rooting for there. I'm rooting for a pickup, a continuing pickup in international travel, uh, which increases their tra- uh, cross-border transactions. That's their growth area, uh, and I see it continuing. Potentially something has changed here at PayPal. Maybe it's on the encouragement of Elliott Management, but the new CFO, Blake Jorgensen, is someone who was at Electronic Arts and utilized buybacks aggressively when he came to the uh, Electronic Arts in 2012, through 2013, through 2014, it worked. He's gonna use the same strategy here. PayPal has already announced the $15 billion addition That's a to big the buyback. 2022 current authorization that has 2.8 billion left on it. Let's remember that this is a company that in the last three years has only bought back $9 billion worth of their stock. So new CFO that's going to prioritize a buyback strategy. If you are going to own this name, the reason to do so is solely predicated on the belief that they're going to return capital to shareholders. Yeah, I don't think that's the only reason you should own that stock. But what I will say is I think it's ingenious to uh, you know have sh- PayPal buying back as many shares as possible. I don't think the stock's going to be under $100 forever and ever. Let's just put it that way. I, I'm full belief this stock's on its way to $200 to $300 over the next few years. And so every share management can get under $100 Right now, I say buy, 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 buy. If I look out there at like the potential for acquisitions of other fintechs, I'm not so convinced because other fintechs are usually massive money losers. So if a PayPal was to go out there and spend that crazy amount of cash on, a, let's say, one of those companies, then it's also not just going to be that they deplete a bunch of cash on the balance sheet or took on a bunch of debt, but then simultaneously it's going to hurt their profitability, which PayPal is definitely trying to attract a lot of the value investors now at this point in time. And value investors really look at your net income. They're going to look at your EPS. That's the most important thing for them, even more important than revenue growth and and, and those sorts of things. Okay. So for PayPal, uh, yeah, as a shareholder of that company, buy every share in sight under a hundred dollars from the, you know, if I was talking to the management team, buy every share in sight under a hundred dollars and, um, you know, just continue to do so. If it goes over 150, start to lay back on the buyback and um, just kind of play it that way. That's kind of the way I would do it if I was them. So yeah, next one up here, we're interested in small and mid cap equities. By the way, if you've got an opinion on PayPal stock, positive, negative, whatever, um, I'd love to hear your, per, your you know, perspective in the comments section.
talking earlier about yields. Um, the two-year, it's, it's amazing to think that a year ago, the two-year yield was at about a quarter of a percent, less than. And right now, as you point out, um, they're at cycle highs. The 10-year note, though, is still w well off of the early summer highs. And I'm wondering what you think that's... That's a nice outfit, by the way. It looks Christmassy. I like it. Nulls. I think it's signaling a direct read through to what Powell has been telling us about the path of monetary policy going forward. Jackson Hole was very much a reiteration that the Fed is going to stay hawkish until inflation comes down. JP Morgan private bank. You, you know about the private bank? Know. You know about the JP Morgan private bank? Anybody? Mm -hmm. One month does not make a trend. Um, use, use a big bala if you know about the JP Morgan private bank. Let's just put it that way. Over the course of the next two weeks, we're going to be looking for what happens out of that CPI print, but also heavily focused on what comes with the jobs report on Friday. And to us, I, I think it's just a reflection of elevated recession risks and also this potential that, you know, eventually the hiking cycle will end and longer term, the Fed, you know, will start bringing its policy rate back down. You know, it's sort of a push pull because the harder the Fed goes against inflation, i.e. Um, the bigger the rate hikes, the more determined they are to get inflation back to 2%. Uh, maybe that's a good thing, but maybe that also uh, makes the recession probability higher. Uh, how do you view that? Look, it's a lot of pretzel logic right now, but I think <laughs> priority number one absolutely has to be getting inflation down. When we think about things like the JOLTS report that we got yesterday, the fact that consumer confidence is moving back up, and that you've had this easing in financial conditions because of the rally, I think the Fed is very easily justified in going by 75 come September. Um, but let's, again, you know, wait and see what happens with CPI, because two months might at least be you know, it, perhaps not clear and convincing enough evidence that inflation is coming down, but enough in the right direction to, to get us 50 instead in September. You've got a global view, so I'm curious how you um, factor in Europe to all of this. And with energy prices just skyrocketing and things not looking to get much better there, at least, how does that impact your view, if at all, of the United States? And is there... Um, Shout out to all the European viewers. My gosh, man, that's a messy situation with energy costs. Woo! Aye, 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 man. Insane. There's sort of a trade signal out of Europe, i.e. maybe don't even go near any of it because of what's going on? Look, we're not saying completely avoid Europe. Our best thinking is still very much to remain globally diversified in our allocations. But within Europe, we're very much leaning more towards the, you know, what we deem to be more resilient parts of the market, um, like those tilted to the luxury consumer. In terms of how this might LVMH? affect the United States overall, I know a lot of people were chalking up Friday sell-off, for example, exclusively to the Fed. But remember that we had a lot of hawkishness coming out of the ECB as well. And while we have had these historical instances of Europe going into recession without the United States going into recession, it's very possible that we could start to import some of that weakness. And we are cognizant of the fact that risks are higher in Europe. So definitely something we continue to monitor and something that we're not being dismissive of. Um, but for the U.S., I, I think the primary driver, of course, is going to continue to be the Fed and our own inflationary picture. Yeah, we'll get the ECB meeting the week before the Fed, so that should be an interesting couple of weeks ahead for us. Um, I'm curious, Elise, it sounds like you, you would be very defensive even in the United States. Is that right? Um, very defensive. You know, we're, we're certainly directionally defensive, but as we mm -hmm. kind of look across this landscape, we are getting excited by some of the opportunities that, you know, the current risk um, distribution of risks is starting to present. You know, we're towing back into some of those risk seeking of the markets in areas like preferreds, for example, which we think offer a better kind of risk return Preferred profile stock. than an area like high yield. And we're also starting to get more and more interested in small and mid cap equities because of all of the pain that they've already been through. Um, um, Aha! Let's, let's just finish this out and then I'll give my opinion. Just kind of thinking about positioning for the next cycle and what the rebound is going to look like on the other side of this. Okay, what she just said there is very important. And that's uh, from JP Morgan Private Bank. If you don't know what JP Morgan Private Bank is, look it up. It's uh, a little more important than everything else at JP Morgan, okay? So. Nonetheless, um, positioning and starting to position the smalls and mids for the next cycle. Now, when you hear commentary like that, the thing you must understand is people are already starting to get into that thought process, right? And it's, it's going to be, it's a stage process, so everybody doesn't go there right away. But somebody like a JP Morgan private bank, they're dealing with the highest net worth individuals in the world, okay? So their thought process 
They're always going to be first. They're always going to be first to these things. They're going to sell first. They're going to buy first. Their thought process is already starting to go to, hey, we need to start positioning ourselves or thinking about positioning ourselves very soon here in smalls and mids because guess what happens when you come out of one of these, uh, you know, they're just called crashes, bear markets, whatever you want to call it, okay? The first thing that really starts to soar is the smalls and mids. As when you go into the crash, the first thing that gets absolutely devastated is the smalls and mids. Remember, with a lot of the small and mid cap stocks, these stocks basically topped in like January, February of 2021. That seems like 100 years ago. And those started to fall first, and then it was a whole domino effect down to the bottom, right? And so whenever we really for real switch to the upside, guess what's gonna pull up the most? It's gonna be the smalls and mids. Those babies are gonna to fly to the moon, whichever ones didn't go bankrupt essentially. And um, it's gonna be, a, a, let's just call it a grand day. And then, well, you could still be going through economic devastation at that time and people could be calling it a fake rally, getting very frustrated. Why well, is the market going up? It's all this bad news still. Look at this, look at that. And they won't understand it, but you never understand it when you're in it. And uh, you know, it all starts to make sense. A year from now, two years from now, it will make sense what was going on. It just doesn't make sense at that moment when you're in it, especially if you're not, you know, you haven't been doing it for a long time. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed this video. As always, I appreciate you joining me. Much love. That was kind of a beast of a video there. One of the longest videos we've ever done on this channel. Less than 10,000 subscribers on the channel right now. I appreciate each and every one of you guys for being here. Thank you so much. And uh, also, we've got that massive deal coming up on the Become a Master Stock Market course, my number one stock market course ever. If you want to receive that deal when the flash sale drops on Labor Day, check out pinned comment down there and we will send that over to you. Thank you for watching and have a great day.